On December 8, 1941, Pearl Harbor lay in ruins. On that day, America declared war on Japan. And on that same day, in a little field in Bridgeport, Connecticut, the American helicopter came of age. A young pilot, Charles Lester Morris, climbed into the seat of the world's first workable single-rotor helicopter, the Sikorsky VS-300. A new control system was about to be tested, a full cyclic pitch main rotor to control direction of flight, and a small vertical tail rotor to swing the helicopter on its axis. A control system still used in 90% of present-day helicopters. After a few seconds, it began to rock in the air, and Morris was forced to set it back down on the ground. For the helicopter's designer, Igor Sikorsky, the flight must have been a disappointment. But within a month, the VS-300 would be flying beautifully. Igor Sikorsky was born in Kiev, Russia in 1889. He grew up in a home full of books and conversation. He read works of Jules Verne about balloons and vertical flight machines and listened to the fireside stories told by his mother. Legends of Icarus and Bucephalus. The legends of flight. I think the legend of the helicopter uh, goes back a very, very long way because there's no doubt about it that man has dreamt of flying for hundreds of thousands of years created legends of the uh, flying carpets, the flying thrones, Pegasus, Bucephalus. All of these dreams, interestingly, had one thing in common. All of them were vertical takeoff and landing machines. None of these required a runway. And I think it was with dreams such as these that uh, my father grew up, and that's where this lifelong love affair with a helicopter started. It was said that Leonardo da Vinci experimented with air screws like that. A number of other People tried to build helicopters. I myself attempted to build two in 1909 and 1910. These two crude helicopters were inspired by stories of the Wright brothers and a visit to Paris in 1909, where Sikorsky met and talked with some of the most famous French aviators of the day. But while Sikorsky's passion was for vertical flight, Russia at the time needed fixed-wing aircraft. Sikorsky became an airplane designer. His success was immediate. And then the power of his ambition began to show. He designed and built the world's first four-engine aircraft and called it, appropriately, the Grand. He learned to fly and became his own test pilot. In 1917, the Russian Revolution came, and with it, the great emigration of white Russian refugees. Igor joined the flood. But New York in 1919 was by no means the promised land. Times were tough for refugees, and there were no opportunities for a white Russian aircraft designer. Ironically, it was a group of other white Russian immigrants who helped him. It was a number of these white Russian refugees eventually, who of course had all heard or had known of my father's work in Russia, that convinced him to try again. And they all pooled their money, and it was with a very significant amount of $800 in cash that they uh, started work in the backyard of a chicken farm just outside of Roosevelt Field on Long Island. These 12 or 14 Russians actually donated their labor. They worked for free and uh, started the company. At a very critical point, just as they had it nearly completed, they ran out of money. And it was then that a very great uh, Russian composer and concert pianist named Sergei Rachmaninov came to the aid of this struggling company and gave the, at that time, the very significant sum of $5,000. In the early 1930s, Sikorsky joined forces with transatlantic hero Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh's energy was now directed at international travel, and the large Sikorsky flying boats were just right for exploring potential airline routes across the oceans of the world. There was no time for Sikorsky's first love, the helicopter. While this is underway, it would not be wise to start something new because it is not. Helicopter was not a project 
which were put just to charge to the engineers to do something about it, and to test pilot to test and to do something about it also. It was a thing which called for attention, I would say love, I would say all energy, knowledge and support which a man can put in. Even so, the helicopter was never far from his mind. In 1931, he successfully patented a single rotor design. Young Sergei Sikorsky did what he could to help. I was already growing up. I remember very, very clearly building small balsa wood models of these helicopters for my father's use in demonstrating them, first of all, to his own engineering people, many of whom, mind you, were very skeptical of the idea of uh, abandoning the flying boat and getting into the helicopter. But by late 1939, Igor Sikorsky had built and was attempting to fly the first crude form of his VS-300 helicopter. In addition to all of this problem of literally walking out on very thin ice with a totally new and untested principle, was a very minor problem that Igor Sikorsky had never flown a helicopter before in his life. No one had. So first he had to teach himself to fly the machine. The VS-300 had a cyclic pitch main rotor and a vertical tail rotor to control direction. But learning to fly it wasn't easy. You had to lift the aircraft off the ground, teach yourself to hold it off the ground, say a foot or two or three feet off the ground, and then teach yourself how to be able to control the machine so that it stays within more or less one or two feet. That was the secret. Later, the challenge of uh, slowly increasing forward flight called for another set of solutions, called for another set of redesigning of the main rotor head, called for nearly another year and a half of very hard, difficult work. Part of this delay was caused by an incident on December 9, 1939. Serge Gluerev was the pilot. Stability and control were still very limited. A simple, unexpected gust of wind was too much to deal with. Serge Gluerev was not injured, but the VS-300 was, and Igor Sikorsky decided on another approach. He replaced the cyclic pitch control with two small horizontal rotors. Unequal pitch change on these rotors would roll the machine left or right. Equal pitch change would lift or drop the tail. It appeared to work quite well, and in March 1940, it was tested in flight. Sikorsky made many flights of 20 minutes or more, and quickly learned to hover it, or move it backwards or sideways. But the controls were still uncertain. The first public demonstration, with Igor Sikorsky as pilot, underlined a weakness of this control system. While a hover was reasonably controllable, in forward flight, downwash from the main rotor disturbed the rear rotors and caused instability. Controlling the machine was very difficult, and often, a quick return to the earth was the only safe course. I remember one of my father's uh, closest friends and uh, cohorts on the helicopter project. Also a white Russian refugee with a, uh, with a rather uh, intriguing accent saying, it was very interesting time. It was time of educated guess and crystal ball. And that's the way the helicopter was designed. Igor Sikorsky now set out to analyze and cure the forward flight problem. On October 9, 1940, after weeks of test flights, he was making a series of forward runs about 20 feet above the ground when one of the rear pylons snapped away. The VS-300 crashed again. Igor, unhurt, stood for a long moment looking at the wreckage. Then he said, I think I'll get her home now. You really never knew whether it was the machine, whether the design was at fault or the test pilot was at fault. But I remember Dad with a grin in his eye saying, since both responsibilities were concentrated in one person, namely myself, I couldn't put the blame on anyone else. And I had to accept it, repair the machine, and carry on. He did. 
and he got on with the task of refining the design and making it work. The pylons were swept back and the tips raised to get them out of the downwash. The torque rotor was also raised on its own new pylon. In April 1941, Igor tackled the world helicopter endurance record with the VS-300 in this configuration. Igor Sikorsky's new world record was 1 hour, 32 minutes, and 26 seconds. Tests continued on this modified T-bone layout. Forward flight was now possible, and its controllability was greatly extended. Earlier in 1941, the Army Air Corps had been embarrassed to order a two-place version with this control system to be called the XR-4. The encouraging performance of the VS-300 brought Igor Sikorsky closer to a long-held dream, to build a vehicle that could go anywhere, regardless of terrain, and set itself down in confined spaces on land or water, something that would give, in Igor Sikorsky's words, unlimited freedom of transportation. At the time, the helicopter's potential to do things no airplane could do was not always obvious. I remember a good friend of mine and a very prominent designer of uh, fish basket. When would the helicopter go faster than the airplane? Do you know that? I said, yes, I know. The answer is never. When would the helicopter be more efficient than the airplane? Do you know that? I also said, yes, I know that. Never. But. I said that helicopter will do a number of jobs which no airplane will do and which in fact nothing else will do except the helicopter. Charles Lester Morris made his first flight in the VS-300 in May 1941. So early in the summer of 1941, the decision was made to return to cyclic pitch control in the VS-300 helicopter. It would be so much simpler than having those awkward and cumbersome tail rotor outriggers. We would try to do it in two stages. First, we would get rid of the outriggers, of course. Then, we would use cyclic pitch control just for the lateral control of the machine, rolling it left and right. And for longitudinal control, we would use a single horizontal tail rotor mounted on a tower high above the tail, well out of the downwashed air from the main rotor. In early August, we rolled the machine out with this new arrangement, and there were a lot of adjustments and changes to be made. But on August 14, 1941, remember that date, we suddenly discovered in one day that we had a completely flyable helicopter. Les Morris's first flight with the new control layout was a revelation. He was able to do forward runs of 70 miles an hour, quick stops, back up, and do things they'd only dreamed of with the old system, and no problems developed. Even so, Igor Sikorsky decided that this was not the right control system for the new Army helicopter, the Sikorsky XR-4. And since the VS-300 was the test vehicle, it would be modified to test the next stage of control development. So the beautiful, flyable little VS-300 was once again torn apart. The tail tower was removed, and the rotor hub was realigned for full cyclic pitch control. On December 8, 1941, the day that the United States declared herself at war with Japan, we rolled the ship out for the first trial. After the elation of his previous flights in the BS-300, Les Morris's first experience with the cyclic pitch version was a disappointment. 
This flight introduced doubts into the minds of the whole team, and they had to back off the test program to analyze the situation. What was wrong? Was it part of the rotor system, or was it something to do with the whole design? Some months earlier, the oil dampeners, or oleo struts, had been removed from the rotor blades. And as it turned out, that was the problem. The old oleo struts were recalled to active service, but they were installed at the rotor hub in such a way that they would damp the blades in the horizontal plane. Like a miracle from the dark ages, they turned the trick. Flights were made forward, backward, and sideward, and no wobble or resonance was detected. Thus, on the last day of 1941, the VS-300 demonstrated another completely satisfactory control system. At last, they had it right. The classic Sikorsky configuration had arrived. A single main rotor with full cyclic control and a small vertical anti-torque rotor with variable pitch. Sikorsky's dream of unlimited freedom of transportation was within reach. But he also saw the helicopter as a means of saving lives. Now, with control problems apparently solved, there was no limit to what might be achieved. Igor Sikorsky had indeed taken the chance to live his life over again. For the second time, he had built a flying machine without knowing how, and had taught himself to fly it. This was the final version of the VS-300, the culmination of three and a half years of development. The name was still the same, but not much else was. Probably, having lived through much of the development of the VS-300, I can say with some minor confidence that the only uh, pieces of the helicopter that are identical to that first machine that lifted off in September 1939 are the pilot's seat and certain of the structure around the, uh, around the engine. I would dare say everything else was bent, broken, smashed, or modified during the three and a half years of the helicopter's existence. And now, the race was on to educate the public and decision makers about the virtues of the helicopter. Demonstrations of extreme controllability were the order of the day. The wide open spaces were out. The trick now was to land in the smallest area you could fit. The VS-300 successor, the XR-4, was formally accepted by the Army on May 30th, 1942, and went into production as the R-4. As it demonstrates here, even with the power off in auto rotation, it could come very close to landing on a handkerchief. Igor Sikorsky's helicopters had already begun to change the face of aviation, and he had achieved what the cynics had said was impossible. Any responsible engineer could prove to you that the single main lifting rotor, and then to steal power from that rotor to drive a small little rudder type rotor is improper and inefficient. And yet Igor Sikorsky felt that was the logical way to go. And it's interesting that today this configuration that was uh, so criticized when he first applied it uh, is the dominant configuration. And in fact, roughly 95% of all of the helicopters in the world built since World War II are built with this same configuration. Igor Sikorsky died in 1972. He saw 30 vibrant years of helicopter development, and for those years, saw how his pioneering work came to change the face of 20th century life. But the helicopter was not his only passion. Like his Renaissance forerunner, Leonardo da Vinci, his interests were wide-ranging, and he was very good at a great many things. The further away he gets, the more we realize what a great and unique person he was. Not only as an aeronautical engineer, not only as a very, very gifted test pilot, but also as a philosopher, as a historian, as an amateur astronomer, as also as a very brilliant archaeologist and historian. I think he would have been a 
very, very great success in a great many professions. We're just lucky that he chose aviation as his first love.